grab your Bibles and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians chapter 15. When we get to heaven and we see Jesus after the resurrection from the dead, what will our bodies be like? And what will our minds be like? Now let me give you, as you're turning to 1 Corinthians 15, a really, really short answer, but it's an important answer, and it sets the table for everything else we're going to try to say this morning. We're taking a break from our normal uh, procedure and and walking through a a book of the Bible, uh, verse by verse, as we normally do, to think about this topic of heaven. So what will our minds be like, and what will our bodies be like? Well, here is the short answer. Jesus said... John 21, 5, that he is making all things new. And if you just had to put one thought in your mind, that would be it. When we get to heaven, we'll have a new body, and we're going to have a new mind. Now, that's helpful, but it's also unhelpful. Because everything we have that's new, by definition, that's a time stamp, it's new, That means, by definition, it's the highest quality it will ever be. From that point, it's going to diminish. You have new friends, and you have old friends, right? So hopefully the quality didn't diminish in your friends that you've known for a long time. But when you have a new something, a new automobile, a new relationship, a new house, it's new. It's probably at that moment the best it's ever going to be. And after that, since we're under the curse, everything gets worse. But heaven is a reversal of the earth. And so, while it's hard to wrap our minds around this, we have to say it, that in heaven, everything is new, and it gets better. Everything in heaven is new, and it gets newer. God being perfect is in a perfect environment, and so when we get to heaven, the first day of heaven, we're going to be overwhelmed by the perfection that we'll see, experience, and the perfect body and perfect mind that we'll be in, and yet at the same time, while we don't know at that point, we're going to grow in our understanding. We're going to grow in what we experience. There will be no law of diminishing returns. And Jonathan Edwards said like this, happiness in heaven is progressive, it just, it just grows and grows and grows. So in heaven, we're experiencing the new, and it gets better. Now, this is so helpful because uh, this helps us understand so many questions that we have about heaven, such as, am I going to have a memory of what went on in heaven? Will I understand what is actually going on on earth when I'm in heaven? Will I be me in heaven? Or when I get to heaven and I see my mom who's there, or my friend or my loved one, will they be an angel? Will they be a ghost? Will they be a spirit? Or will I actually see my mom? So what we're going to do this morning is we're going to talk about uh, our new bodies for a little bit. Then we're going to talk about our new minds a little bit more. And then we'll stop and we'll just try to answer four questions that seem to be lingering on our minds about heaven. So let's start with our bodies. What will our new bodies be like in heaven? That's the question we're trying to answer. And the most helpful text is right here. 1 Corinthians 15, look at verse 35. But someone will ask, how are the dead raised? With what kind of body do they come? Now that's exactly the question we want answered. When we're in heaven in our resurrected state, our resurrected bodies, with what kind of body do they come? Here's the answer. You foolish person. Now I don't care who you are, that's just rude. I mean, you just... Right, that's, we just want to know. Why is he saying, you foolish person? Why is he doing that? Well, he's making this kind of emotional response, to, I think perhaps to make a point, that what we already know about our bodies helps us understand what they will be. What they are helps us understand what they will be. So let's keep reading. Verse 36, you foolish person. What you sow does not come to life unless it dies. And what you sow is not the body that is to be, but a bare kernel, perhaps of wheat or of some other grain. But God gives it a body as he has chosen in each kind of seed its own body. So that's really helpful right there. The relationship to our earthly bodies, to our heavenly bodies, is the same relationship of a seed to a tree, a seed to a plant. What's the relationship? Well, the relationship, one, comes from the other. 
So we can draw from this, and we're about to read, that our heavenly bodies will look similar to our earthly bodies. But in order to receive that heavenly body, we have to first die. Because from that dead earthly body, out of that is going to come our new spiritual body. So skip down to verse 42. So it is with the resurrection of the dead. What is sown is perishable. What is raised is imperishable. Oh, so that's helpful. There's a relationship to my earthly body and my heavenly body. So they look similar in some way, but there's a big difference. This body is perishable, but that body is imperishable. Now that brings up a great question, and we'll just stop and try to answer these as we go, and that is, what age will we be in heaven? And like many things about heaven, there is no chapter and verse. So that was a way of saying, we don't know. A good title for this series would be, All the Things We Don't Know. Uh, that's okay not to know things, as long as we don't make things up and say they're from God, we just speculate. So here's what we think we might know. Some people say, well, we're always going to be age 33, that was the age that Jesus died. But here's what we do know, we know that we have an imperishable body, therefore it can perish. At some point, our body starts, stops growing and it starts decaying. At what specific age that is, we don't exactly know. We can imagine our 20s or our 30s, we reach our peak, we're fully grown, if you will, fully optimum for our physical bodies. So perhaps we'll be in that recognizable state. So God created Adam not as an infant, but created him as an adult in heaven. So perhaps there's some point in which, this is the point where our body stops perishing. It's at that point, if you will, that we'll know each other in heaven. So verse 43, it is sown in dishonor, it is raised in glory. I think it's a reference to sin. We have this perpetual struggle with sin. In Romans 7, Paul calls himself a wretch. Wretched man that I am. The best I try to attempt for God is stained by sin. The happiest moments I've ever experienced in this life still have that little hint, that cloud around us that I have this sinful person. And yet, although it's sown in dishonor, this seed of my body, it is raised in glory. Verse 43 again, and is sown in weakness. It is raised in power. I don't have to elaborate on what weakness is in this life. Verse 44, it is sown as a natural body. It is raised as a spiritual body. Now, everything really we want to know about the body is wrapped up in that phrase, a spiritual body. Now, that seems contradictory. A body is flesh. Uh, it's concrete. What is spiritual is not flesh. It's abstract. But that's a great way to think about the body. It's a body. It's a real body. It's similar to the body that you have now, except it has a spiritual dimension. So that's it. But let's keep reading because he helps us understand it. Verse 44, thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last Adam became a life-giving spirit. So now he's opening up our minds of understanding. Who is the first Adam? What's well, Adam? Genesis chapter 1, 2, 3. Who is the second Adam? Well, Romans 5 tells us the second Adam is, is Jesus. So how is the first Adam like the second Adam? Well, Romans 5 tells us all the sin in the world came through the first Adam, but all the salvation in the world came through the second Adam. So they're not comparisons, if you will, they're, they're contrasts. Jesus is the anti-type of Adam. He did all the things Adam should have done but never did. So, uh, let's read that again. Thus it is written, the first man, Adam, became a living being. The last man, Adam, became a life-giving spirit. But it is not the spiritual that is first, but the natural and then the spiritual. We live, and then we die, and we receive a spiritual body. The natural comes first. The first man was from the earth, a man of dust. The second man is from heaven. Now, that's just so helpful. Just, we have this phenomenal culture of adoption and foster care inside of our church. What adoptive parents cannot do is they cannot change the DNA of the child that they're adopting. At the end of the day, that DNA belongs to some other, what we might call biological parents. And yet, he makes this incredible statement that when we die, our DNA, if you will, is changed to reflect our true heavenly father. Verse 47, the first man was from earth, that's where we came from, from the dust. The second man is from heaven. That's right, Jesus came down from heaven. As was the man of dust, so are also those who are of the dust. And as is the man of heaven, 
so also are those who are of heaven. So believers actually are from heaven. So we go back, God changes our DNA, and we're like the man of heaven. To put a fine point on it, verse 49, just as we have borne the image of the man of dust, we shall also bear the image of heaven, the man of heaven. We all look like Adam. We all came from Adam originally. And yet God changes our, our DNA composition so we get to heaven. We are born into the image of Jesus. That's the whole promise of Romans chapter 8. God accomplishes his purpose toward us is to be made like the person of Jesus. Uh, listen to this. This is 1 John 3, 2. Beloved, we are God's children now. And what we will be has not yet appeared. That's a spiritual body. What's it like? But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him. So perhaps here's the biggest clue to wrap our minds around. We're going to be like Jesus. Well, what was Jesus like after when he was raised from the dead? Well, he, he looked like he did before his resurrection. He had a physical body that resembled who he was. Jesus was not limited to walls. Remember the disciples were hiding there John chapter 20 behind locked doors and Jesus just appears to them so we can speculate perhaps then that we won't be limited to those type of physical properties Jesus ate fish in front of them later they shared breakfast on the beach John chapter 21 so he had in all these ways were symbolic or these ways resembled rather his earthly body and yet it was a spiritual body which, taken from chapter 21 and verse 4 of Revelation, means this body was absolutely perfect. Now, while the body is perfect, I want to be careful to say it would not be what we call perfection. You say, what do you mean by that? Well, when we talk a perfect body, we often think of um, a perfect specimen, perfect proportion. But when the disciples saw Jesus, he looked like Jesus. The average Middle Eastern man at that time, Jewish man in the first century, was somewhere between 5'7 or 5'10, or what we all know as the perfect height range, right around there. <laughs> and when they saw Jesus, they didn't say, Jesus, you, you, you look amazing. You've grown two feet. And how did you get that 25-inch waist and those 50-inch shoulders? How did, that, how did that happen? Now, he didn't turn into a specimen of what we today in 2022 would think of as a personal specimen because, after all, that changes throughout time, even in American history. The concept of what is a good body or perfect body or perfect physiology, that changes over times and cultures. So the purpose is not to give us a, a vision like we would have now of a perfection, absolute perfection of the body, but the bodies that we have now will be perfected. And so like Jesus' resurrection of the dead, we believe we're going to look like we look, we're going to act like we lack, act, we're going to have the same properties that we have now, just yet in a perfect state. And so here, our bodies in heaven are going to be made new. They won't have any pain they won't have any sorrow, suffering, to, suffering attached to it. They will never perish. They'll never dimension. They'll never diminish. They'll be in a state of newness when we get to heaven. And everything we experience in our bodies in heaven will always be new and will be in the process of getting newer because heaven is a reversal of this life. So I don't really understand that. Well, you're in 1 Corinthians. Go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Just turn to your left a couple of pages and go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And I want us to switch now. We've been talking about our heavenly bodies. Let's talk about our heavenly minds. What will our minds be like in heaven? We know that our heavenly bodies will be a spiritual body. That's what we learned from 1 Corinthians 15. That they'll be like Jesus, we learned from 1 Corinthians 15 and 1 John 3. And so we have a hint of what that's like because we've been studying the resurrected body of Jesus. So what will our minds be like? Well, here's the most helpful verse, I think. 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 12. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So we get to heaven, we now have a heavenly body that's unaffected by the decay of this earth. 
And then when I get to heaven, I also have a heavenly mind. And what a phenomenal thought. As we said earlier, we have no idea what the capacity of our minds will be in heaven because all of our minds on this earth are limited by uh, the sinfulness of humanity. And so we'll have these minds that are not constrained by all the things going on in the earth. And so when we get to heaven, the best and kind of, I think, the dominant thought that we need to think about that'll kind of overshadow everything else we're going to say about our heavenly minds is that we'll be able to see clearly. This is what he says. Right now we see like in a foggy mirror, dimly. But then we're going to see face to face. So here's a good way to think about it. When we get to heaven, we will not be able to know immediately everything, but we'll have a brand new heavenly perspective. So we get to heaven, don't think about knowing everything. Think about seeing everything. So we use those words interchangeably. We say, I see that now. Or we say, I, I understand that now. So the point is, is that not God gives us this repertoire, this repository of knowledge, brother. He creates within us this capacity to learn and learn and grow and grow to see. It's like Jesus said in John 16, I've got so much more to tell you, but literally you don't have the capacity to see it now. Jesus will never say that in heaven. Jesus, I'm just I'm overwhelmed by what you've just taught me. Well, let me teach you some more. This is a phenomenal thought. We're just getting started. Because without any limitations on the mind, what's it going to be like to be in a state of ever-expanding knowledge and that every day we're in heaven, there's going to be something new that we learn? What a phenomenal thought. Everything we experience in our bodies in heaven will be like we've never experienced it before. It's going to be brand new with no diminishing Everything we learn in heaven is going to be the same way. It's going to be a constant state of an ever-expanding mind with absolutely no limitations on it. What are we going to be able to think and know and understand? What a remarkable thought. So occasionally in my home, I'm called for tech support. And when you're called for tech support, but you're not a techie, you always do the same thing. You unplug the computer. Now, I know this because if you call people for tech support, did you say, the first thing they tell you, did you unplug it? So now I just know you unplug it, you count to 10, you replug it in. 90% of the problems are, are, are solved that way. And if you're going to take your phone and you're going to trade it in, or you're going to get rid of that phone in some way, you always take everything off that phone. They call it wiping. Have you wiped the phone? In other words, have you taken everything off? And one of the thoughts that enters our mind is, okay, look, if for heaven to be heavenly, I can't have any thoughts about what happened on earth or what is happening on earth. So doesn't God just wipe our minds? Does he erase everything? Well, I don't think that's possible. Scripture actually teaches, I think, um, by way uh, of indirection, it teaches us that we will have memory in heaven. You say, well, how will heaven be heavenly and us still have memories of things going on on earth? Will that make us sad? Well, no. Uh, I've read it twice, but let me just quote it again. This is Revelation chapter 21 and verse 4. We need to read it in this context. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and death will be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. All right. So how do we have memories? Many of them are painful memories. How does God not erase our minds and yet make heaven actually heavenly? Well, there's two reasons, a small but important reason and then a really big reason. Here's the small but important reason. Without memories, it would be hard to receive our heavenly rewards, our heavenly rewards. So this is what Jesus said in Luke 14. If you, instead of spending money on yourself, you resource those people who are the least of these, we would call the underserved. Jesus said, quote, John 14, 14, and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you, for you will be repaid at the resurrection of the just. So when we get to heaven, we're going to be repaid for things we've done on earth in some way. There is a heavenly reward. We talked a lot about that last week. We're going to talk a lot about it in two weeks. Lots of rewards will heaven. heaven. Well, what would those rewards even mean if we had no memory of them? What's going to make that moment heavenly is that we're going to be able to attach the memory that we had on earth to the reward that we're receiving in heaven. What a glorious thought. So I think memories have to be there for that reason to receive the reward. But secondly, the reason why it's important to have heavenly memories is because God is going to take all of human history 
and help us understand that. And to understand that, we have to understand what's gone on in human history. So take your Bible and turn to Ephesians. You're in 1 Corinthians. Uh, go to your right a little bit and turn to Ephesians chapter 2, a very important passage of Scripture. Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. So the first reason I believe we're going to have memories in heaven is because of heavenly reward. Uh, but the second reason we're going to have memories in heaven is because God is going to help us understand grace. Now think about this. Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. When the thief on the cross got to heaven, he didn't say, who are you to Jesus and why am I here? Jesus said that because when the thief on the cross got to heaven, he saw Jesus and understood why he was here. He had a memory, just a few hours old, but he had a memory of what had taken place on earth. Why would that be heavenly to understand what Jesus had said to him if it didn't matter anyway? So clearly there was a memory in heaven. So here's Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 6. And raised us up with him and seated us with him in the heavenly places in Christ Jesus. So what this saying is, when we become a Christian, there's a sense in which we're already seated in the heavenly places. We're not physically there, we're physically here, but it's as if we're already seated there. Why is it like we're already seated there? Verse 7, Ephesians 2, 7. So that in the coming ages he might show the immeasurable riches of his grace and kindness toward us in Christ Jesus. Now this is either real or not. In the ages to come. What ages? Well, he's already told us in verse 6, it's heavenly. In heaven, he's going to show the immeasurable riches of his grace. God's grace cannot be measured. It's immeasurable. It can't be exhausted, which means we have an eternity to think about grace. What is grace? You've heard the acronym before, God's riches at Christ's expense. That's helpful, but in some, grace is receiving something that we don't deserve. Why don't we deserve salvation? Well, because we're sinners. If we did deserve it, it wouldn't be grace. Right? Grace is not related to any activity we've done. It's, it's a gift that God bestows on us. This is why grace boggles the mind and grace is ultimately of God because it's getting something we don't deserve. But if God is going to ever expand our minds to understand his grace, that doesn't even make sense if we don't understand why we don't deserve it. So in some way in heaven, there has to be an understanding of sinfulness if heaven is about celebrating the grace of God. Does that make sense? How can we celebrate God's grace if we don't understand that we're ever in need of it? We understand we're in need of it because we understand the horrors of earth and all the things of life that we've been to. You say, why doesn't it bring me down? Well, we don't know mechanically how that happens. We just believe in the promise of Revelation 21, 4 that it does. But we also have a hint in 1 Corinthians 13 that we have such a heavenly perspective that any sorrow we would feel about an old memory is greatly overshadowed by this reality that we see the work of God throughout all the ages, he says, bring it to its ultimate plan. And that great vision of thing, that heavenly sight that I can't even have right now in this mind, it's going to take a new mind to give it there, that overshadows any of the pain of this life that brought us suffering and sorrow. Here it is in Revelation chapter 5. Here's really a clear picture of it. You can turn uh, to the scriptures if you like. I'm going to read several. Revelation chapter 5. This is a vision of praying around the throne. Revelation chapter 5 and verse 9. And they sang a new song. Worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals for you were slain and by your blood you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation and you have made them a kingdom and priest to our God and they shall reign on the earth. And again, in our limited way of understanding, we think, I just can't think of any bad things that happened on earth. But here they are singing about not bad things that happened, but the worst thing that ever happened on earth. Nothing worse ever took place on earth than the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. What a horrible event. And yet, with a heavenly perspective, not know everything, but could see everything, 1 Corinthians 13, 12, they gather around the throne and, say, and praise and worship God because by his death and resurrection, he has made 
all things new and right. And so, ironically perhaps, counterintuitively, the memories of heaven, the memories we have still in heaven bring us joy. Joy because we receive a heavenly reward and joy because now, as if for the first time, we understand God's great overarching plan displayed in his immeasurable grace. What a thought. A good way to understand this is to think of John chapter 20. Remember, we spent a little bit of time in this passage, Jesus, after he rose from the dead. John chapter 20 and verse 19. Jesus already appeared to Mary. Mary's gone back and told the disciples. They know that Jesus is alive, but they don't know where he is. And John chapter 20, verse 19 says this. On the evening of that day... The first day of the week, the doors being locked where the disciples were for fear of the Jews, Jesus came and and stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. And the disciples were glad that they saw the Lord. There was so much there to learn from. First of all, why did Jesus do this? Why did he come into this room? And why did he, without them even asking, this wasn't the story of Thomas, that's coming later. Why did he even ask them? Voluntarily, he showed them his his hands and he showed them his side. Well, he did that so they could put all the pieces together, right? You knew me before I was crucified. You know that I was crucified. But now I'm risen. So I want to show you something unbelievable. It's me. It's me. They knew it was Jesus. It's me. And yet, look at these wounds. These wounds prove that though I was dead, now I live. That's what he was doing. But here's another question. Why could he do that? Well, the reason why he could do that and it made sense to them is because they knew he was crucified. In other words, they had to tap into their memories before. And what what made this moment in John 20 so glorious is not that God erased their minds. But God did so much better. He gave them new sight. And and they backed away and said, Jesus is simply saying by showing them the scars and the the wounds, look, here's the whole picture. I was me, I'm me. But here's the evidence of what I've been through in this life. Which makes us conclude that the only scars in heaven will be those of Jesus. He's still in that resurrected body. By the way, you know what a scar is? It's a wound that's been healed. And if you worry that heaven won't be heavenly because of something we've done in the past or something you know of or something you're aware of, this passage is for you. Every scar in your life, every wound in your life is made right in the scars of Jesus. All the wounds are healed. And now we have perfect sight. The disciples could see Jesus, just as one day we'll see Jesus. And these disciples are on the trajectory of being made like Jesus, just like we are. So this is what the Bible teaches us about our bodies. Our bodies will be spiritual bodies, they'll be made new, and they'll be like Jesus. Our minds will be made new, meaning that we have this ever-increasing capacity throughout all of creation to learn more about how God has put all this together. We'll have this new sight, 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Well, let me answer a few questions this raises to mind. And first of all is this, will we be recognizable in heaven? And the answer seems to be yes. I mean, Jesus said in John 14, verse 4, I'm going to prepare a place for you that where I am, you may be also. Again, Jesus said to the thief on the cross, today you will be with me in paradise. Uh, Not a spirit, not a ghost, not a form of you, but you will be with me in heaven. And so if you've ever wondered that um, heaven will be a time of being reunited with people that we love, we have every evidence that that's the case. 
After all, in Luke chapter 16, we have this vision inside of heaven, even though it's in the form of a parable, and there is Lazarus there as Lazarus. There is Abraham there as Abraham. We have Matthew chapter 17, the transfiguration, where the disciples see Abraham and they see Moses. Why do they recognize them as Abraham and Moses? Because evidently they have some type of physical quality that makes them recognizable as who they were in this life. So I'll be me in heaven, you'll be you in heaven. We'll just be so much better because he'll make all things new. So yes, it seems to me that we will be recognizable in heaven. Here's another question. Will we in heaven, and this is actually one that I've heard a lot. I think it's actually a, a good question people ask. Will we be angels in heaven? Now this one is not at all difficult to answer. The answer is no. We will not be angels in heaven. Why? Well, because that would be a demotion. You say, no, angels are tall, and they're awesome, and they're fearful. Why wouldn't we want to be like angels? Well, the Bible makes it very clear in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 14, that angels are to serve us. Angels aren't the goal. They're the servants of God's goal. God's goal is to recreate from humanity, not the angelic host, from humanity, a people of all tribes and tongues to praise him, Revelation chapter 7. Those don't come for the angels, they come for humanity. That's God's glory, not to take perfect beings and have them praise him, but to take people that are not perfect beings, like you and me, and to have us praise and worship him. That's God's glory. That's the redeemed church. And in fact, it's very clear in 1, excuse me, 1 Peter chapter 1 and verse 12. If you need like one single verse to help us understand this, this would be it. 1 Peter 1 and 12. It was revealed to them that they were serving not themselves, as speaking of the Old Testament prophets, but you. In the things that have now been announced to you through those who preach the good news to you. So the Old Testament prophets were thinking about us when they wrote, not even knowing the whole gospel picture. The good news to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, watch this, things into which the angels long to look. The prophets hope to explain to us salvation, the salvation into which the angels long to look. And looking here is like looking in 1 Corinthians 13. It means no. They really wanted to know this. Why did they want to know it? Because they don't. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you have experienced a salvation that angels will never experience. They don't know the depth of sin. They don't know the pain of loss. They don't know the guilt of repeated failure. They never cry out, as Paul did in Romans 7, I'm such a wretch, and then feel the overwhelming grace of God. Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. Overwhelm us and we raise our hands and ever-loving praise and wonder and say, God, why did you even save me? It's miraculous. You're overwhelmed by the grace of God. Angels are curious about that because they've never experienced it. So we'll never be angels in heaven. We'll be something better than angels. They long to experience what we are going to experience in heaven. Here's the third question, and that is, will we have pain in heaven? Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Uh, if you want to know more about heaven, this is an important passage. I just want to read a few verses, but we'll come back to it. Uh, you can come back to it at a later time. Will there be pain in heaven? I think that's a really good question. Here it is. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 1. For we know that if the tent that is our earthly home is destroyed, we have a building from God, a house not made with hands, eternal in the heavens. Now that's just really the whole driving metaphor of this, a tent versus a house. What's the house? Well, it's not the temple of God, I think the Old Testament temple. He's pitting a tent versus a temple as an earthly body versus a spiritual body. What's the big difference? Well, the big difference is a tent is portable, mobile. A tent suggests I'm not going to be here that long. A house represents permanence. So this body that we're in is very, very temporary. It lasts for a few years and it's gone. Our spiritual body, the house that we're prepared for is eternal. So this is why over and over again we're rearranging our lives to ask this question, how do my decisions in this life make the most sense in the next life? While I'm living in a tent, what can I do to expand my capacity for joy when I'm living in the house? And for the same reason you would not stay in a hotel room overnight, 
and pour your life savings into fixing it up. The same reason we don't live just for this life. It's like a wisp and it's gone away. We live for our true home, our house in heaven. Verse 2, for in this tent we groan, longing to put on with our heavenly dwelling. If indeed putting it on, we may not be found naked. For while we are still in this tent, we groan, being burdened. Not that we would be unclothed, but, but what we excuse me, but that we would be further clothed so that what is mortal may be swallowed up by life. He who has prepared us for this very thing is God, who has given us the Spirit as his guarantee, so we are always of good courage. We know that while we're at home in the body, we're away from the Lord. We walk by faith and not by sight. Yes, we have good courage, and we would rather be away from the body, the tent, and at home with the Lord. But so whether we are at home or away, we make it our aim to please him. For we must all appear for the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for all he has done in the body, whether good or evil. So much we learn from this passage, the relationship between what we do in this tent and what our heavenly experience is going to be like. But nevertheless, this is short, frail, temporary, broken, and painful until we get home and God makes all things new. Now, one other question that we have, and I think this is a, a big question, that is, do people in heaven know what's going on here on the earth? Do they know? And if you've <laughs> lost someone uh, very close to you, you've wondered, do they see me? Do they know what's going on? Well, let me read Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. We don't have one verse that proves absolutely one case or the other, but let's speculate from the verses that we do have. This is Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. This is the opening of the seven seals coming out of that great worship service in chapter 5. We have the great seals and later the trumpets and the bowls, all of God's judgment. And as this seal is being opened... This is Revelation chapter 6 and verse 9. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne, people that were martyrs. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? So here in this scenario, the people that were in heaven understood the activities of God on the earth. And evidently with these new minds, they've already experienced 1 Corinthians 13, 12. They've got the new insight to understand how this all big plan fits together. And they've got one big cheering phrase, God, execute the plan. Let's, let's go. They're, they're all in wanting God to execute his plan. So it seems they did know what was going on on the earth. Also, you have in Luke chapter 15, we referenced this last week, but let me read it again because this is a very um, important passage of Scripture. It says, Luke chapter 15, verse 7, Just so I tell you, there will be more joy in heaven over one sinner who repents and over 99 righteous persons who need no repentance. And then this, verse 10, Just so I tell you, there is joy before the angels of God over one sinner who repents. So not the angels that are rejoicing, but actually joy in the presence of the angels. Who's in the presence of the angels? Well, that's you, and that's me, and that's God, that's Jesus. Uh, there's all this rejoicing in heaven when someone on earth comes to know Christ. So for that to be in any sense real, there has to be some awareness that something on earth has actually happened. So they have to be aware of it. Now, let me just stop and say this is really important. That doesn't mean we pray to those people who are in heaven and asking them to intervene for those on the earth. We don't pray to saints. We don't pray to people who have gone before us asking them to come and do something for us. I've got a buddy in heaven. Um, could he take vengeance on my enemies? Uh, no, he can't do that. That's not an appropriate prayer to pray. Why? Well, because there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Jesus is the only one who hears our prayers, knows our hearts, and goes to the Father before us. So we don't pray to those who have gone before us, and yet we have reason to believe, at least from these two passages, that they're aware of things are going on the earth. You say, well, again, back to where we started, how could that be heavenly? Because they know what the real story is. They have the full picture. They have this new sight that allows them to see every activity as something that is advancing the plan of God. So... 
God takes our bodies and he makes them new and getting newer. Spiritual body like Jesus. He takes our minds, he makes them new, and then he makes those minds even newer. Not erasing them, giving memories that are able to see the whole plan and purpose of God. So what do we do with this? What's our application to this? I just want to give two brief thoughts. How does all this affect the way we live our lives? Well, we just, the answer is twofold. We need a heavenly view of our earthly bodies. What do I mean by that? Well, it just means we need to take care of our bodies in this life because God obviously cares for them in heaven, but we need a heavenly view of them. Imagine as a pastor, I'm, I'm sitting in my office and I have an appointment one day with a, with a couple and uh, they come into my office and uh, the first thing I notice about them is that they're just beautiful people. He's extremely handsome and she's very, very beautiful and they sit down and say, like, we gotta talk to you about a problem and uh, the wife begins, I'm just struggling because I'm so ugly, I'm hideous, I know my husband wants him to look at me. I'm awful. Uh, I'm a terrible, terrible person. I shouldn't even be in society, you know, and this doesn't make sense to me because they're both just beautiful people. Um, would I say, would it be a good counseling to say, look, I, I know exactly what you're saying. I know a great plastic surgeon. Now, now that, that would be stupid. Why? Well, because the answer, listen, listen, the problem is not the body. The problem is the mind. We get so frustrated with our bodies. Some things we can fix and we should. Some things we can't fix. But in all of that, the way we treat our bodies in this earth should have a heavenly perspective to it. What's going on for eternity that should change the way I think about our bodies? And also I think we need to have a heavenly view of our earthly minds. Now, this is in the realm of speculation. And that's okay to speculate as long as I'm telling you I'm speculating. This is speculation. But if we get to heaven and our minds are perfect, which means I'm not going to uh, unlearn or forget things that I knew on this earth. In other words, I've learned a certain amount of things, but I'm not going to be able to lose that knowledge. And if it's also true, and it seems to be from Ephesians chapter 2, that God is going to unpack for more of us how all of human history has fit into this immeasurable grace then it seems to me in this life, I would want to know as much about God as possible. I would want to know as much about his word. I would know as, want to know as much about history as I possibly could. Why? Well, because that will be the starting place in heaven upon which God will build all the things that I'm going to learn and grow in in heaven. I'm not saying it's a competition like I want to know more than you. It's not a competition. It's just that, that I want to win. That's all. No, I'm just joking. It's not, a, it's not a competition. The point is, though, if God is going to continue to expand our minds of learning, why wouldn't we want to know as much as we possibly could here so that expanse would be even greater, a greater capacity for learning and for understanding? When I think about the mind and the body, I just think in this life, we, we really ought to go for it. What has God called you to do? Do that with all of your strength because God cares about our work. Play as hard as you can. Raise your family as hard as you can. Advance the kingdom as hard as you possibly can. Why? Because all these things, actually, as we execute them well, have, have a semblance, a shadow, a mirror of things that are yet to come in the heavenly sphere. Jim Elliott said this, quote, wherever you are, be all there. Live to the hilt every situation you believe to be the will of God. Because Paul said, this life is like a seed. The true plan is coming. So plant well, die for the kingdom, so that out of that growth comes our new and spiritual life that awaits us.